And good morning, everyone. My name's Carl Rosen. I'm a department head in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate and chair of the search committee for Forest Resources Head. Uh, today is our second candidate, uh, Mike Kilgore. He's professor and interim department head, Forest Resources Department, University of Minnesota. Uh, I'm sure most of you know him. He has very deep roots with the department. He's a BS uh, in forest resources, well, it was forestry then, University of Minnesota in recreation uh, resource management. He got that in 1982. He's a master's degree in forestry with an emphasis in forest economics and policy, 1984. And then a PhD uh, at the University of Minnesota in forestry with an emphasis on forest resource economics and policy, and that was in 1990. Uh, so, not exactly sure how Mike did this, but it seemed like he was working while he was getting his degrees. Uh, he uh, was an agricultural econ econ econom economics uh, specialist for the Minnesota Department of Revenue in 1984 to 1987. And then uh, 1987 to 1994, he served as state planning director for the uh, Minnesota Environmental Quality Board. Then from 1994, this was after his PhD, he served uh, as forest and economic policy specialist for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. He was appointed as executive director of the Minnesota, um, Minnesota Forest Resource Council and served in that capacity till, till 2001, which was a pivotal year for Mike because he joined the University of Minnesota Department of Forestry um, forest Resources as an assistant professor with a research and teaching appointment uh, and uh, was promoted to associate professor in 2006 and then full professor in 2010. In uh, 2002, he served as director of the Center of Environmental and Natural Resource Policy for the Forest Resources Department. And then in 2008 uh, to 2016, he served as the director of the NRSM Graduate Studies Program, and then was named interim head of the Forest Resources Department in 2016. His research has focused on uh, resource sustainability with an emphasis on social and economic impacts of, for, uh, of forest and other wild land use. Um, uh, timber harvesting and forest management practices. Since joining the department, Mike has taught numerous undergraduate and graduate courses, um, most notably in the area of economics and natural resource management, forest economics, and forest policy. So with that, Mike will be giving his vision for the Department of Forest Resources. Thank you, Mike. Thank Let's you. Carl. Welcome, Mike. Oh. Thank you, Carl, and, and uh, special thanks to the search committee for the invitation to uh, talk to you about my vision for the Forest Resources Department. I'm very grateful for uh, the next hour to share that vision and some of the ideas I have about the future of this department. So what I want to cover in the next 40 minutes or so are four major areas. Uh, a number of you know quite well my background, but there are a number in the audience who don't, so I want to bring everyone up to speed just to understand where I come from, the work I've done not only here but outside of the university. Um, talk a little bit about my leadership and management style. Talk about the vision for the Forest Resources Department and as part of that vision some of the opportunities that I see going forward uh, as well as some of the uh, challenges uh, in accomplishing that vision. And I understand, Carl, that we have about 15 or 20 minutes for questions yes, at the end. Right. Okay, very good. So this is the Reader's Digest condensed version of my background and qualifications. I've spent 17 years, as Carl mentioned, before coming to the University of Minnesota outside of academia in a number of different positions. Um, 16 years as a faculty member in the Forest Resources Department. Um, my administrative and leadership experiences span over 20 years, both inside this institution and external to it. Um, I have a lot of experience working with different organizations, again, both within and outside the university in developing an organizational vision, mission priorities and strategies. Um, uh, I have a very strong background and record of consensus building. The first job I took 
uh, outside of graduate school was in that area, and I think along the way there hasn't been a job that hasn't required that skill set in uh, my line over the, of work over the last 30 or so years. And then the last background uh, piece that's uh, I think worth noting is the fact that I've got strong roots here to the department, and as such I'm very familiar with the department, its faculty, its history, its opportunities, and some of the weaknesses. So just again, I want to bring everyone up to speed. Um, as Carl mentioned, I have three degrees in forestry. My baccalaureate degree was in recreation resource management. Uh, my master and PhDs degrees are in forestry, but an emphasis in economics, policy, and administration. Um, unlike almost every faculty member here, um, my path to academia was quite different. I spent half of my career outside of this university or any higher education institution. Um, uh, in fact, uh, when I was uh, approached about applying for this job back in 2000, I initially turned it down because I had a really great experiences outside of higher education. But as fate uh, has it, I'm here. But before joining the university, I held a number of positions. I was an agricultural economist right out of graduate school. Um, I was a planning director. I managed a very large environmental project. And I was an executive director of a state organization. And as you can see in those positions, like many people, uh, their, their career develops in, from a highly technical position, like being an economist, doing a lot of economic analysis, econometrics, to more administrative managerial leadership positions. And that was my progression of work um, outside the university. Uh, when I came to the university in 2001, I was an assistant prof professor. I became promoted and tenured in 2006, and then was made full professor in 2010. In 2008, I was asked by the graduate faculty to lead the Natural Resources Science and Management Graduate Studies Program. For those of you who don't know about that, that is the college's second largest graduate program. We have about 115 to 120 students in that program. And I was in that capacity until about a year ago when Dean Brian Boer asked me to lead on an interim basis this department. Um, I've had a number of other appointments within the university. I've listed a couple here. Um, from 2009 to 2016, I chaired our college's Graduate Research Policy and Review Committee, or GRPRC. And basically what that is, is it's a, 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 a committee of graduate study directors, and now more recently it includes some postdocs and graduate students. And it's really to develop policy um, um, and to some degree uh, financing arrangements that, that supports our graduate education within the college. I do need to mention that um, in 2012 to 2013, I was on the committee but not, did not serve as the chair, but otherwise was the chair of that group. Um, I was also appointed to the university-wide Graduate Education Council, um, both the Provisional Council when it was first formed uh, back in 2010 and then was elected to that when it was uh, its first permanent body uh, a year and a half later. And then I served on the University Senate for three years. In terms of my research, my research focus uh, really emphasizes four areas, economics, policy, administration, and governance. And the application of those areas and those disciplines is in forest and wildlands management. If you had to summarize my research portfolio, I would describe it the way I've got it on the screen, these five major areas. A principal one has been looking at the economic efficiency questions, effectiveness questions regarding forest management. This very straightforward application of economic uh, methods and approaches to the management of forests and related resources. I've spent a lot of time in my research looking at various economic or policy tools and evaluating their use and effectiveness. Um, similarly, I've worked with a number of colleagues on the design and the administration of programs and policies at both state and, na and national levels. Um, I have a particular interest in, value, in la forest land as an asset, so I have over a quarter century of sales data for every forest land transaction in Minnesota. I've been collecting that over the last quarter century. I've worked very closely with the uh, Minnesota Land Economics. Uh, Professor Steve Taft would manage that website within the Applied Economics Department. Um, looking at also questions regarding financing of forest land acquisitions, <coughs> looking at undivided interest ownerships, taxation questions, and um, um, parcelization. And then a last area that has been a particular of interest of mine is looking at what we affectionately call 
family forest landowners, in particular looking at ownership patterns and looking at uh, more recently some of the applying economic methods for valuation of ecosystem services. For example, estimating supply schedules for carbon, um, their willingness to provide recreational access on those lands. In terms of my uh, out, uh, accomplishments in, in research, I've got 80 uh, referee journal articles that span those five areas, over 100 technical reports, a lot of presentations, um, over 50 grants, uh, and in terms of total dollars, half of those are as the PI. My research network, uh, a number of you are, have been colleagues of mine in my research. My research spans from pretty local or state. For example, I've done research in partnership with the Minnesota Forest Resources Council, State of Minnesota, Department of Natural Resources, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. On a regional level, partnering with colleagues from the Northern Research Station next door, and more recently in the past maybe six years, the Southern Research Station. Um, nationally, I've done a fair amount of work with the Family Forest Research Center, which is headquartered at Amherst, University of Massachusetts Amherst, but has a national focus. And my international work has been, um, uh, for example, in the area of of carbon, carbon mar markets, biomass, and uh, for example with the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. I've done a fair amount of work with them, but this is just an illustration of some of the different colleagues and institutions that I've been working with over my years in terms of my research portfolio. In terms of where my work is published, um, here is a list of the journals that publish the work that I've been part of. Um, the journals really have five themes. The first is an economics and policy theme. So for example, Journal of Forest Economics, Forest Policy and Economics, those are central to the work that I do. Um, forestry journals like the Journal of Forestry and the regional journals when they existed, the Southern, Northern, and the Western Journal. Um, a third theme of journals are those related to human dimensions. For example, Society and Natural Resources um, uh, would be another one, Human Dimensions of Wildlife, uh, where I published a fourth area is in land use planning, like land use policy, that journal I've published in, in that a, a few times. And that fifth theme is in the area of environmental management. And if, if you look on the list, there are a couple of those, uh, the Journal of Environmental Planning and Management, and Environmental Impact Assessment. So uh, lots of different journal outlets. My philosophy has been really to reach out to audiences beyond my core disciplinary to extend the work to other areas that might not be otherwise familiar with some of the work that myself and colleagues have been doing. In terms of teaching, um, I regularly have a fairly extensive teaching load, about 400 student credit hours per year. Um, my large class is my economics of natural resource management class, which typically has about 100 to 115 students. It's a four credit class. I developed and co-taught a Methods for Environmental and Natural Resource Policy Analysis class with Professor Dennis Becker that we've instructed over the years. Um, I co-teach the Orientation and Information session for all of our new freshmen and transfer students into the Forest and Natural Resource Management curriculum. And I teach on an independent study base with my graduate students in Economic Analysis of Forestry Projects class. Um, I've won the Newman uh, Art of Teaching Award back in 2009, and I've participated in a number of teaching improvement programs. Back in the day, they called it the Bush Early Career Faculty Development Program. I participated in that, as well as some individualized classes in how to diversify your instruction and your curriculum. In terms of where I've taught beyond the University of Minnesota, so I, I've had a number of opportunities to guest lecture around the country and elsewhere. I won't go through the list, you can read them as well as mine, but it includes a mix of both uh, domestic uh, institutions as well as those overseas. In terms of my international experience, uh, I've had international experience in research uh, uh, and consulting, teaching, and, uh, and some in administration and program development. Um, the, on the teaching side, I was a co-instructor for a graduate class up at Umia. Sweden um, at the Faculty of Forest Sciences, and that was uh, a graduate level class in economics and planning. Um, I've done a fair amount of research. Most of my research has focused in the Scandinavian countries, as you can see. Um, I've done a fair amount of work recently with the Norwegian University of Life Sciences in the areas of biomass and forest carbon markets. I've had a number of graduate students uh, working with colleagues there in, in several projects. 
Um, I've worked uh, in Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Luxembourg on research related to forest certification. And then in terms of uh, our neighbor to the north, I've done a fair amount of work on certification. I was asked by the Canadian Council at some years ago to be part of a review team to look at their first forest research program. So we started in Nova Scotia and worked our way across the continent. Uh, and then I've done some consulting work on software and lumber trade. Um, a few years ago, I was, as the director of graduate studies, I was part of a team from the University of Minnesota that went to Vienna to look at opportunities to develop a joint graduate study program between NRSM and BOKU. So I have a fair amount of international experience, and again, most of it has been focused in Western Europe. In terms of diversity and inclusion, I have a strong commitment uh, and experience with diversity and inclusion. I've listed a number of things here. I guess I want to call your attention to one that I'm quite proud of, which is one, my last year as the chair of our college's graduate education and policy research committee. Uh, one of the things that we did, and I think probably the most important and influential in my time with that committee, is develop a new fellowship program for students that are underrepresented and students of color. It was called the Graduate Opportunity Fellowship back then. I think its name has changed since then. But it's an opportunity to provide a fellowship to uh, students of color and students coming from underrepresented populations. Beyond, so I worked with our uh, associate dean for research in the college to develop that fellowship program. We were amazed at the response from applicants to our program in terms of how well it was received, how strong the applications were, and the matriculation rate in that first year. And my understanding in talking to May Davenport and, other words, and others is that it is still continues to be a very strong program and recruiting tool within the college. Um, I also have been promoting um, within, as the interim head through um, uh, some of the things I can do with respect to scholarships and our recruitment efforts. We're reaching out into other areas uh, for recruiting students that we may have not touched in the past as much. Um, I've done, as I mentioned, some training program. I advise a Dove Scholar, and I've been a very strong promoter of the Dove Fellowships. In fact, I would venture to guess that in my time as DGS, NRSM probably had more Dove Fellowship applications than any other graduate program. And then more recently, uh, I've been working with uh, folks from the Fond du Lac uh, uh, Natural Resources Program and the um, Itasca Community College to identify ways to provide higher education opportunities for some of the tribal firefighters who are interested in earning a baccalaureate degree. So we're just in the um, initial stages of that discussion. Um, in terms of my leadership and service at the university, so I've been ahead of this department for the last year. Uh, I've been the chair of the department's strategic planning committee, which developed a strategic plan a couple of years ago. As I mentioned, I was the DGS. I have been the chair of our college's uh, graduate research and review committee. Um, and I've had these other activities at the university-wide level. So I've had a lot of different leadership service experiences within the university. I've also had a number beyond the university, both prior to coming to the university and then um, once I was a faculty member. And uh, just a couple of note, and I want to I focus on the top two, but um, I am a member of the Society of American Foresters. I've been a member for many, many years. I served on their National Policy Committee. I'm a fellow of the Society, which is the highest distinction to its members. I've been an editor of a journal and um, served on, a, on a, a number of councils. I mentioned the Guardianship Council with the Freshwater Society as an example. But I do want to highlight the top two, which is I was asked back um, about 12 years ago by Governor Palente at the time to chair a Conservation Legacy Council and then about nine years ago, I was appointed by the uh, Senate Majority Leader to be a member of the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council, uh, and I was voted by their members to serve as its initial chair. And I, and I want to highlight those two because they have some pretty similar and important characteristics. Um, number one, they were really risky initiatives. They were new. Um, they were looking at things that are not run-of-the-mill with respect to the Conservation Legacy Council. The governor was interested in tossing up the cards and seeing how we might better organize and fund our conservation and natural resource programs within the state. 
So it was a very different way of thinking at how we support conservation, environmental, and natural resource management. With the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council, it was part of the legacy funds that were uh, voted in as an amendment to the Constitution in 2008. Um, it required um, deciding on allocating roughly $100 million of funding for conservation programs every year. Um, my interactions in both of those uh, experiences, but not, not limited to those, really was contingent upon successful consensus building because on both of those we had a mix of legislators and a mix of citizen members. Um, I worked at the highest levels for the Conservation Legacy Council. My reporting was to Governor Palente with the uh, Outdoor Heritage Council. My reporting was to the Senate Majority Leader, the um, uh, Speaker of the House, and then the chairs of the House and Senate um, uh, Finance Committee. So I was involved in some of the highest levels of negotiations um, within state government. So as, in terms of administrative experience, I, as Carl mentioned, I was the ex first executive director of the Minnesota Forest Resources Council for six years. I've been the director of the graduate studies program, interim head, and the chair of the LSOHC. And I point those out because in each one of those, they require a lot of the things that a head is needed to do, which is to, man to develop and manage a budget, manage personnel, and to oversee operations. And so I've had a lot of experience um, in doing those in a number of different capacities over the years. In terms of my strategic planning experience, I put a few of uh, some of the initiatives I've been involved with up here. The top one, I think our faculty and staff recognize this. This is the Forest Resource Department's latest strategic plan. It was developed in 2014. I chaired that effort, and some of my colleagues in the room were part of that effort as well. The one on the lower left is the Conservation Legacy Council's strategic framework for, for how Minnesota might redesign its governance, administration, and financing of its uh, conservation programs. And the one here is uh, probably one of the most important things I did when I was with the Outdoor Heritage Council, which is, if you recall, the Outdoor Heritage Fund and the Legacy Amendments are 25 years. And what I worked through our council and led was an initiative to develop a framework for over the 25 years, how those legacy councils might be spent so that at the end of 25 years we have some demonstrated outcomes in terms of protection, enhancement, and restoration of our natural resources. So in summary, I've got a strong record of interdisciplinary research, teaching, and engagement um, here at the university. I've had a number of leadership and administrative appointments both here and outside. Uh, my work has largely uh, been driven by consensus-based solutions and working with stakeholders. I've had a f uh, experience and a commitment to diversity and inclusion uh, both within the classroom and outside. Um, given my history, I, I really know the department well. Um, and I have a vision, which I want to talk about in just a minute, and uh, some ideas about how we can grow the Forest Resource Department's impact. But before I do that, let me just give you a few minutes of my thoughts about leadership and management, because in this position, those are very important, and I suspect the search committee and the dean are looking for what does this person say about those two qualifications. So here's my, the style that, and for those of you who know me and have seen me for the last year, this is, should be nothing new, but really the things that I um, hold dearly in terms of leadership and philosophy is you know, make decisions based on core values and principles. So in this position, that means, does it advance the mission of the Forest Resources Department? Mission being teaching, research, and outreach. Does it put students first? I mean, those are two core principles that really I look to when any major decision is made with respect to this department. Play to the organizational strengths. I'll be, I'll be the first to admit I don't, you know, we have some really strong areas and we have some areas that maybe could be improved, but we want to play to what are our competitive advantages in forest resources. I know that I don't have all the answers and so um, I need to rely on our faculty and staff to really help out uh, because I, in this inter type of interdisciplinary department, my knowledge depth is, is, has limitations with respect to all of what we do. You know, managing both up and down the organization is critically important and I say that in particularly for us in a large college like CFANS that can oftentimes get overwhelmed by other interests. So it's not only leadership down 
or amongst or within the department, but also managing up to the college and, and at some times beyond. For example, uh, this past March when we were working with the Board of Regents and the President up at Cloquet, an opportunity to tell our story. Um, be flexible and know when to change course. I regularly re revisit that definition of insanity and uh, I apply it sometimes. Um, this don't put organization before mission, that is really tempting and you know, particularly when budgets are tight, it's oftentimes our, our immediate reaction of most leaders is to try and hold together and preserve the organization. And oftentimes it's at the expense of the mission of the organization. And, and we really need to make sure that our, our mission is central and focused. Um, I always be looking for the next opportunity. That really is a major part of this department head's role, is to figure out what are those opportunities that we can capture. And the last one is don't accept conventional wisdom as a given. Um, this is really true with respect to instruction. Instruction is involving the skill sets needed by our employers, the types of technology that we use in the classroom, the technology that we employ in our students and our employers use. Um, it's evolving very quickly. And so we can't assume that what was good yesterday is necessarily good today and tomorrow. A little bit on my management style, and I'm not going to read those, but I guess I would just describe my management style as in three points. One is being open, approachable, and accessible. I would hope that would be the case over the past year for those who have been working with me, that I'm very approachable, very accessible. Um, the decision making that is, is done in the department head's office is transparent, and it's open, and it's based on some criteria that I can explain. And the third uh, basically attribute of my management style is to be engaged with the faculty, the staff, and the students. To have a really good sense of the pulse of what's going on around here, what's working well, what's not working so well. Alright, let's turn to vision because this is what you want to hear. So we're at a really good point. This is one of the oldest forestry programs in the country. It has a tremendous record of success. Back in the 90s, the Gorman Report rated this the number one forestry program in the nation. Uh, back in 2010, the National Research Council rated our graduate forestry studies program as up to the second best in the nation among its peers. And our faculty are recognized individually, nationally, internationally. We have some of the top scholars in their field in this building. So we are in a great position to start with. And my vision is that the Forest Resources Department continues to be recognized locally, nationally, internationally as a top-ranked forestry and natural resource program. But that's not going to happen without attention to a number of things. And I want to describe six areas that I think are central to being able to realize that vision. So if we're to maintain the excellence and the leadership of this program, we have to give our attention, in my opinion, to these six areas. So let's talk about the first one, which is promoting excellence in education. Of course, the most important thing we can do here, and as the interim department head or permanent department head, is hire faculty, hire talented teaching faculty, because obviously that's a central part of our mission. Um, as part of that, and related to our program, is to make sure that we have a top quality undergraduate experience. The Forest Resources uh, uh, Undergraduate Program, Forest and Natural Resource Management, has been accredited continuously since accreditation began by the Society of American Foresters, 1935. We're up for accreditation review this fall, uh, in mid-September. I'm very confident we have all the documentation prepared, and I'm very confident we'll have a very good review. There'll be some things pointed out that need to be uh, bolstered, and I suspect um, many of you know what those are, and I'll talk about some of those in just a minute. But overall, we have an outstanding program, and I'm very confident in terms of the reaccreditation. But that is a very important part of um, our work over the next year. Ensuring that our students are getting the training needs um, that our employers are looking for is important, very important. Laura Nelson, who's not here today, um, she'll be doing a, we're going to be employing a survey to get a better pulse of what those training needs are and how they're evolving. Um, another strategy is to make sure we're, we're staying on top in terms of the technology we use in instruction. Now, whether that's 
instruct uh, technology like Moodle or offering new coursework that's related to the field. For example, we're going to be developing, we're developing and we're going to be deploying, Joe's going to be deploying a new course this fall. It'll be the first one on campus dealing with unmanned aircraft systems. So new technologies and how they can be used in the field of forestry and natural resource management. And the last strategy is, and this is really important to me, is we don't want to compromise on our field-based instruction. Our field-based instruction is what sets us apart. Historically, that's what it's been at our roots. Our undergraduate students are required to attend two field sessions, one in August and then an advanced session in May. Um, and I want to make sure that as our program evolves, we don't lose sight of the fact that what sets our program apart from so many is the training we give our students in the field. Right now, our, our enrollment is growing, and it's growing fast. Year to year, our undergraduate enrollment in the forest and natural resource management curriculum has increased 30%. And get it, I just received the latest numbers from Laura. We're over 80 students now for fall that uh, will be in the program. My goal is that we will be able to reach 100 students in the FNRM curriculum by 2020. I think that's a very realistic goal, and we've been doing a number of recruiting um, and outreach strategies that are helping us achieve that goal. Um, as part of the accreditation process, we did a survey of our recent graduates. Um, what we're finding is that our students are getting jobs. They're getting jobs in the area they, want, they like, and they have high levels of satisfaction with their employment. We want to make sure that continues. And we want to make sure that our programs are continually recognized as a top flight forestry program in the country. Now, I haven't mentioned anything about the, uh, the Environmental Science Policy and Management Program. That is another major program within the department that our college has a major role in instruction. The curriculum is coordinated by our faculty. Our faculty teach the majority of the courses in the ESPM curriculum. Uh, there are a number of, it's one of the largest uh, undergraduate programs in the college, and there are some things there that uh, are changing. We're, 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 we're readjusting some of our areas of emphasis, or what we call tracks. There is an issue that I want to work on, and I want to work on with other department heads in the college, and that is um, finding, giving our students in that curriculum, because it is an interdisciplinary curriculum, a better sense of place. And I hear regularly, and as I suspect many of our fa faculty do, that it's not tied to a department home. It's a college-level curriculum. And I want to make sure that our students feel like they're better connected with a department so that they have a more enjoyable, rewarding experience when they're here at the university. A second area is dealing with science. And again, just like in the area of instruction, teaching, we want to hire the best and the brightest scholars I think we are incredibly blessed with the scholarship that we have here at, in Forest Resources now. A um, question was raised earlier this morning in the search committee about our interdisciplinary science and your views on it. Well, we are an interdisciplinary program. I am the one and only economist in the department. It would be a luxury to have more than two individuals in any one given discipline, so we are truly interdisciplinary. If you look at our undergraduate curriculum and the FNRM program, ESPM, our graduate program and NRSM, those are truly interdisciplinary programs. We want to continue to promote that. In terms of what sets us apart from so many other programs is that third bullet. We are conducting research that's policy and management relevant. We aren't doing research just for the sake of doing research. We have strong connections with our stakeholders. The research is used to support their needs, their information needs, their management needs. And one, another very important strategy is to make sure that we're operating with state-of-the-art research facilities, notably the Colgate Forestry Center and the Hubachek Wilderness Research Center. In terms of stakeholder engagement, um, there's really two dimensions to that. So we are the state of Minnesota's only land-grant university. Our faculty have a great, strong commitment to the land-grant mission. Probably, I don't know of any other department that has, that I sense has a, has a greater commitment to that than ours. We have a long historical connection to so many different stakeholders in government, federal, state, and local, industry, NGOs, citizens, landowner groups. We are engaged at many different levels. I've listed a few of them. For example, the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative that Eli Segor uh, leads out of Cloquet. 
Um, you know, this interdisciplinary scholarship, I think the, the backyard phonology project that Rebecca Montgomery is involved in with uh, faculty from the arts department, it's just, you know, true example of a different form of outreach but very effective. You know, Charlie Blinn and others uh, linking into the logger education program and, you know, Gary Johnson really is Minstack. I mean, he's, he's the, been the, the developer and the leader of that. And we want to make sure we continue that important outreach mission and connecting with our stakeholders. Now, one of the things we did this past December as faculty is we did a stakeholder mapping exercise collectively. And you would be amazed at the breadth of connections our individual faculty have. Um, it, it, it blew me away when I looked at the list and, and uh, saw there were stakeholder connections there that I had no idea existed. And I would, as a department, had rely on some of those faculty to help me make additional connections in those areas. The second part that stakeholder uh, connections are important deals simply with our ability to grow. Our, call, our Department of Forest Resources, um, I would say, probably has great order. As I've talked to other department faculty and heads around the country of our type, I don't know of anyone that can say they have greater and deeper and more historic connections to our stakeholders than the Forest Resources Department. And that's important because when, it's, when there's a need for growing the program, whether it be an upgrade at the Cloquet Forestry Center or helping out with an initiative, the fact that we have developed and maintained those really deep connections with so many different stakeholders has really provided uh, support when it's needed to help grow our program within the University of Minnesota. In terms of another very important component of realizing our vision is making sure that we have a welcoming and inclusive environment. A number of strategies that I've listed here, we need to continue the work that has been done and there is a lot of work going on uh, within our faculty to reach out to other communities and it's really at two levels. You know, we have indigenous populations, we have a number of our faculty are, that are working with uh, tribes or bands, uh, we have faculty that are working individually one-on-one, -on -one. Um, with a number of different uh, underrepresented populations. A number of us have been uh, taking um, education and training courses to incorporate different perspectives in instruction and outreach. So I'll give you an example for me in addition to some of the training. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I co-teach the orientation class for forest and natural resource management majors. And I brought into the class as part of the curriculum um, a conservation officer from the Department of Natural Resources uh, who is a Hmong and have that individual just talk about how that community views management and use of natural resources. And I will tell you, it is incredibly an eye-opening experience and the first time I heard it to me as well, but to our students who just had no idea that these perspectives on natural resources could be so divergent. Um, one of the things I've done now, in just as the interim head, is to more formally recognize diversity and inclusion training in the annual reporting of our faculty and staff. And we are in the process now, I've asked a committee of the department, faculty and staff, to update our diversity and inclusion plan. That work is ongoing. We hope to have that uh, diversity plan updated sometime later this year. And, you know, in terms of what, how do we measure success, to me, it's two things. It's we have an increasing diversity uh, within our faculty ranks, our staff ranks, and our student body. And equally important that this is viewed as a very welcoming place for people to work and to study. Okay. Fifth one, our facilities. So we have principally the Cloquet Forestry Center and the Hubbardcheck Wilderness Research Center. Those facilities are wonderful but we are in dire need of some upgrades. Um, our August field session, for example, we have filled up all the beds. And with the growth of enrollment that we're seeing now, that problem is only going to get worse as time goes on. We need greater uh, capacity for lodging. We need to upgrade our research facilities, and we need to have additional teaching space, both at Hubbacheck and at Cloquet. The good news is that we are a high priority list on the high priority list within the university for a $6 million bonding request to add needed upgrades in each one of those three areas. So I'm hopeful that unless things go south in a big way that we will be able to uh, make a request for those needed upgrades in the next couple of years. 
last thing is nurturing our alumni and friends of the department. And with a, a, a department that has such a long standing and such great connections, we have a really wonderful alumni base. Um, we've made investments uh, through the endowments that have been provided to expand our outreach capacity. So for example, we now have uh, in the last few years a newsletter that comes out from the department twice a year. We uh, have a number of initiatives that our faculty lead. For example, the MinStack Field Days that are held out here on the field in August that Gary Johnson uh, leads. A number of alumni events that are done annually, Forester's Day, uh, class reunions that we, in my time as interim head, we had a class reunion last year. We have another um, class reunion that is in the works right now. And then, as I mentioned earlier, our faculty and staff have a lot of individual connections with alumni um, and non-alumni who are, have been very generous donors to the department. Our department has just shy of $20 million in endowment resources um, as a result of the generosity of our of our alumni and friends. And, and the thing that I found is that, you know, while you think the alumni are going to be the primary source, these opportunities arrive really ad hoc. And if you look back at our largest donations to the department, they come from non-alumni. They come from people who love forests or heard about our department, but have no direct connection to our programs, have never sat in a classroom. And I've had over the past year a number of conversations with people who, from a few thousand dollars to lots of money, who some had connections, but others had no connection, but they had a love for forests, for wilderness, for natural resource management in general. Uh, my, my idea is that we want to, let me step back. The endowments that we have in the department put us in a really good position to, relative to several other departments in the college in that we're able to use some of those endowments to support our outreach mission. We're able to hire parts of individuals to do, to enhance recruiting, to do enhanced outreach and messaging, uh, and to hire some, some faculty that we simply are not able to hire otherwise. So it's been a great help for the department. I would like to see uh, in another endowed, we have one endowed chair professorship position here in, in the Forest Resources Department. I would like to see an additional endowed chair position established. Um, I am very optimistic, in fact, that that will happen. Um, it might not be tomorrow, but that eventually in the, in the mid to near term see that happen. So how do we achieve this vision? And I'm going to just try to wrap it up here in the last few minutes. First thing is we want to play to our strengths. So what are our strengths? It's our faculty and our staff and our facilities here on campus and our outstate facilities. We have great faculty and staff. We have we have at, we've had historically excellent research facilities that I pointed out are in need of some upgrades. But overall, um, that's a great starting point. And we have some other strengths. Our department, as I mentioned, recently completed a strategic plan a couple of years ago. It's, you know, plans, the process of developing a strategic plan is where the value is because those plans get outdated as soon as they go into print. But we do have a, a collective sense as a department of where we are and where we need to go. And we need to keep revisiting that. As I mentioned, we had a faculty retreat, a two-day retreat at Cloquet in December, and I thought it was an incredibly valuable retreat because as part of that, we identified a number of strategic opportunities that we're pursuing and we're seeing some tangible results already in the areas of research, teaching, and outreach. We are the state's only land-grant university with the state's only accredited forestry program. That's another strength. And as I mentioned, we historically and continue to be very highly regarded nationally and internationally, both collectively as a program and the recognition that our individual faculty have. We have some challenges, though. We have some very significant challenges. First one is the budget. So this is a picture of our budget since 2010. Kind of ignore these lines down here. These are just the components of the budget. The black line on top is the Department of Forest Resources base budget. That's the budget that's used to hire our staff and our faculty. The red line is the real, the, that value, that budget in real dollars, so it's inflation adjusted. And since 2015, in inflation adjusted dollars, our budget is about 66, uh, 76% uh, today as what it was in 2015, which causes some challenges. Another challenge is that in the last two years, we've lost six faculty positions without replacement. We've lost 
two, three that are in the area of statistics, biometrics, measurements, and modeling, two in geospatial analysis and remote sensing, and one in silviculture. That's a real challenge. For example, our program has seven statistics, biometrics, measurements, and modeling courses that need to be taught, two of which are field-based for our major. They're required classes. We have no tenure, tenure track faculty who have a formal teaching appointment in that area. We have a research assistant professor who is helping out greatly. We just hired, and we also have uh, Matt Russell who doesn't have a formal teaching appointment but has, uh, has been working to help and backfilling in a number of those classes. The remote sensing lab is in, in, it has some real challenges, and it's not the lab itself. It's the fact that three years ago we had three faculty who were generating grants, um, and that grants, grantsmanship helped support the operations of this very unique geospatial lab on the second floor right down the hall here. As a result, we have one faculty member today, Joe Knight, and it's, and it's challenging to maintain and support that center with one faculty per person, particularly in light of the evolution of technology in remote sensing geospatial analysis. We need additional capacity in that area. We have some other challenges. Uh, a number of us rely on federal dollars for research. In some areas, that's going to be a real challenge going in the future. High cost of graduate students. Graduate student costs are north of $42,000 a year now. And we're seeing uh, some faculty that are substituting uh, graduate um, postdocs for graduate students because it's, you get a, an already trained scientist who can help you write grants, write publications. The challenge is that doesn't um, advance our mission of providing education and the next generation of scientists. Um, it's, it's really challenging to compete for the best graduate students in any program. NRSM is included in that. We have a lot of our grants come from state agencies that don't provide ICR or the federal government that provides no ICR. While they're important because they support our graduate students, um, we don't have a lot of the costs that are needed to support our operations covered by those grants. And the last one relates to an earlier comment about the importance of managing up, is maintaining visibility of this program in a large college with 11 departments. But just in closing, you know, in spite of those challenges, um, particularly the budget and the lost faculty capacity. I'm really optimistic about the future of the department. We are top-notch. Our faculty are, and staff are overachievers, no doubt. I mean, I look at the numbers. We just got our instructional uh, information for the past year, our student credit hours. I mean, if you look at per faculty member, our, fac our department faculty teach as much or more than any other department on a per capita basis. Um, last December, we as part of our retreat, we challenged our faculty to look at ways of growing enrollment. Our enrollment student credit hours increased by, I believe, 1,000 student credit hours from last year to this year. A remarkable response by our faculty. And the other thing is that beyond being overachievers, um, you know, everyone hears this, but it truly is the case. This department is the best department, no doubt, to work. These pe the people are incredibly enjoyable to, to work with. I always hear about you know, other departments where there may be some schisms or, or friction between colleagues or whatever. In my time here, I have never seen that to be the case. It's just a great place to be. We have people that are very collegial and love to work together. Um, and so with that, I'll close it and uh, answer any questions. But again, thank you for the opportunity to share with you my background and vision. And I, just in closing, I would be honored to serve as the head of this department. So, um, if there are any questions, um, I will be running the mic around, opening it up. Paul Ellison, I have to ask the question that I always ask, and that is that uh, you aspire to be the department head of a department that's part of a major university. A, uh, very significant university that's known worldwide, uh, one of the best there is. Uh, one of the things that has made it uh, so good, and the departments within it so good, is the is the land grant philosophy, which is really a philosophy of ensuring that uh, faculty, uh, staff, and students are engaged in teaching, research, and service. 
what's your perspective on blending those three program emphasis areas in general? Well, I think that they are tied together. I mean, you're absolutely right, and I mentioned this in my talk, that the commitment of our faculty and staff to the land-grant mission is, is just its incredible. Um, I, I, as in this past year in the interim head position, I've learned so much more about the connections that our faculty have made and our staff have made to different outreach efforts, the, the philosophy of serving the citizens of Minnesota. And I don't see those as necessarily discrete teaching, research, and outreach missions. For example, you look at the classroom and you look at, uh, it's, it's, it's just commonplace that our instruction brings a lot of guest lectures, visiting people, connections that our scholars have made with people, not only in Minnesota but around the world, um, bringing in, for example, people from the Department of Natural Resources or the U.S. Forest Service or the National Park Service, you know, kind of, and, and it is a, a direct result of the connections that our faculty have made as part of that philosophy of extending that land grant mission. And if you look at our service record, I mean, uh, you look at the things that I'd mentioned there, I could, I could, in putting that slide together, I had two slides of bullets of all of the different outreach initiatives that our faculty and staff are engaged in. Um, it is really amazing to me the diff all the, 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 um, the extent of the connections that our faculty have, and it's because of the fact that they believe in the land grant mission. Any other qu any questions online? Other question. Okay. Question. <laughs> You're making me run around now. <laughs> so, Mike, you've been handling this job for a year. Uh, what surprised you the most as you have uh, walked through for a year uh, the machinations that one faces in that role? Um, so let me answer that a couple ways. Things that didn't surprise me is um, the thing that didn't surprise me is the, the, uh, the, the quality of the people and the dedication to their profession of our faculty and staff. When I first took this job a year ago, I sat down and met with every faculty and staff member individually to better understand who they are. This past spring, I had to do that as part of annual review. And I'm continually am amazed at um, um, their accomplishments. So that didn't surprise me. What did surprise me was um, being department head is a, is a number of small victories. You know, you, you think that the department head is this grand vision of leadership and providing that next idea that's going to change the world. And the reality is you show up and by 8 o'clock you're dealing with a problem about an instructor is going to have surgery and what are we going to do to backfill and cover that class. Or we have to move a, a research lab by Monday and it's Friday. How is that going to get done? And so by 4 o'clock you get back in your chair and you look at the work you thought you were going to start at 8 o'clock and it's still there. And that's very different than when you were a professor and you could go in and you could do your data analysis and you you had control over your agenda. Um, in this position, you largely don't have control over your agenda, and I view it as a series. I described this to my wife when she said, how was your day? Well, I had five very small victories, but they add up to being very significant because the department is still working. But it's those types of tactical decisions that are the ones that, I guess, the rewards we have as faculty members are publications and grantsmanship. Mm -mm. It's being able to find a, a TA for a class or to try to find an instructor where the, uh, there, there is none. Thank you for this talk this morning. This is Mike Dockery from the U.S. Forest Service. I appreciate your ideas in, about diversity and inclusion. How do you envision engaging the tribes across the state? That's a really good question. So uh, at a couple of levels, I, as I mentioned, I think you really have to look at engaging them at two levels. I think you need to engage them at, at the community level. And I know our college has a very strong commitment. Our dean, Brian Boer, has been working with faculty in our department and in other departments to identify opportunities to uh, possibly develop faculty positions that are better connected to their, their needs in the area of nutrition and 
um, natural resource management. So working in that area at the community level involves connections like that. Our faculty like Rebecca Montgomery, uh, May Davenport have been working with uh, tribal communities, Fond du Lac um, Community College, for example, you know, Charlie Blinn, Stephen Carlson, Eli Sagor, the list goes on. They've had long historic connections with the White Earth Reservation. Those are great, but also at an individual level. Um, as I mentioned myself, I'm working now with uh, Steve Olson from the Fond du Lac Natural Resources Program, uh, Brad Jones from Itasca, and some others to try and identify opportunities to provide baccalaureate opportunities for some of their employees who are um, doing firefighting and the challenge is they are um, only available during the winter months, so late fall up to early spring, which spans parts of two semesters. So we're trying to figure out a way in which we can provide those. I'm confident that with the right setup with uh, online technology, we're able to do something, but we're just beginning that discussion. Any other questions? We have a few more minutes. I'll, I'll ask a question. How's that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, you uh, listed uh, Cloquet Forestry Center and Hubachek mm -hmm. as areas that you do a lot of work with, but what about some of the ROCs, like the North Central ROC and, and some of the others that right. you could extend your outreach? Right, so we do have a faculty member. Howard Hoganson is located at the Grand Rapids Research and Outreach Center. Andy David, who is our Director of Operations for Cloquet and the Hubachek Wilderness Research Center, is also located at Grand Rapids, so we have two faculty members who are there. Um, those are, so between Cloquet and Grand Rapids, those are the two outreach centers that we have the greatest connections with. That's not to say we don't have any connections with others, but those are the ones where, that are located in the forested regions of the state, and by virtue of that, those are the ones that the, the Forest Resources Department has the greatest affinity to. Do you see any um, expansion there or any um my, my honest answer to that, Carl, is I don't know. Um, I signed up for a ROC tour this summer where we're going to go not only to Cloquet, but we're going over to Crookston ROC. And so I don't have a lot of experience with the ROCs beyond Grand Rapids and Cloquet, but my goal is to be better acquainted with them, to when we have our meetings with the dean's office and the ROC directors, to get a better understanding of their portfolio. So maybe in a year I can give you a better and more okay. complete answer to that, but right now I'm in the learning mode. Okay, very good. Question in the back. <laughs> Could you pass that? Thank you. So, Mike, one of the things that you listed as a strength was consensus building. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could give us some examples of strategies that you use for that. Do you, does collaboration come into play? And I'm asking that partly because I feel like the university and the way it's organized sometimes tr does not foster consensus and collaboration, but more this kind of siloization. And so I'm just wondering about your strategies, if that's one of your, if that's one of your strengths for building those kinds of consensus and collaboration. Well, I've had a lot of experience in that area, um, but the situation has to be right. I mean, if you're talking about developing a collaborative relationship, there has to be something in it for all parties. So all parties have to be able and willing to come to the table knowing that not being part of that discussion, they're going to be worse off. And that's been my experience. Not all situations uh, work for consensus building. You try to strive for that, but in some areas, you're not set up in a position where consensus building is possible. In terms of my own work in leading, for example, um, the Conservation Legacy Council, which is the governor commissioned the council, and then chairing the Outdoor Heritage Council, both of those involve the mix of legislators and citizens, I'll call them ordinary citizens. And you can imagine their philosophies about spending priorities, governance, organization of government are incredibly different. Uh, legislators have caucuses that they work with and so they have very different agendas. And as the chair, um, you know, a big part of my time was basically maintaining that open dialogue and communication with different members individually of each of those councils. Because that's the way when, when, when you foster that openness and discussion and being able to hear other points of view and having others hear points of view, at least you have a better chance as, at consensus building. And in both of those instances, all the members, and I had to reinforce this, the power of their work was dependent upon developing consensus solutions. Because if we didn't, 
In one case, the legislature would make up their own mind, which we didn't want. In the other case, the governor would have said, thanks, but no thanks. So, I mean, there had to be an incentive to come to the table, and there was in both cases, but it required a lot of late-night conversations with individual members to try and maintain that open dialogue. Okay, um, it is noon, and uh, Mike has another uh, meeting with the graduate students uh, very, very soon, and, and undergraduates, I think, as well. So let's thank Mike for uh, the seminar. And if you have any other questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask them on, on your own. Um, also, I want to remind everybody to fill out the evaluation form. There's one online through the college site. And I don't know if we, do we have, yep, there's some in the back there as well. So we really want your input. So thank you very much.